Okay, we're back live here in San Francisco, California. This is Oracle Open World 2012, exclusive coverage on siliconangle.com. The Cube, this is our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. And it's exciting here, it's shut down the whole streets of San Francisco, 50,000 people. I'm John Furrier, the founder of siliconangle.com, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org, and we're here with Jay Kidd, who's the Senior Vice President at NetApp, a company that he helped rename <laughs> uh, from Network Appliance, which our previous guest, Vu Nguyen, referred to NetApp <laughs> as Network Appliance. Old habits die hard, but, uh, but, but the new name's sticking and it uh, flows off the tongue. So welcome <laughs> to theCUBE, Jay. Thanks, Jay, glad to be, really glad to be here. Good to see you, and uh, it was good. We were trying to, to get uh, Vu Nguyen to talk about NetApp in a little bit more detail, but of course they can't do that. <laughs> right. at, uh, at NASA JPL, so you can tell us how great NetApp <laughs> yeah. is. And so we're here at Oracle Open World. It's kind of an interesting um, event. You know, we were at VMworld last month, and um, different vibe, very open. Yeah. Everybody's friendly. It's all about the ecosystem here. It's about the ecosystem, but it's a lot more competitive. But interestingly, NetApp doesn't seem to be in the line of fire directly, anyway, of Oracle, which I guess is a good thing. Tom Georgian says they that Oracle dislikes us less than others. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is how we put it. <laughs> but, um, but still, there, I mean, I don't know if you can say it, but I can say it, Oracle's definitely a customer of NetApp and has been for a long, long time. And uh, even though it's probably migrating to uh, more sun storage. But, so here we are, and uh, what do you think of uh, open world and what's, uh, what's NetApp doing here? You know, your comparison of this in VMworld is, is really good because VMworld has become probably the biggest infrastructure show. And I see Oracle is really becoming the, the middleware, the application, the database. Mm. Oracle's such an enormous company with such a tremendous impact on the industry. Uh, it covers such a wide range of things. But, uh, you know, it's nice to be out of the line of fire for <laughs> Oracle every now and then. <laughs> but we even have been doing some things with their 12C announcement. Um, we did some work with them for the integration of 12C with our cloning technology to let you actually clone the component databases, those pluggable databases that, uh, that plug into the master. So we still got a great relationship, a great partnership with and it Oracle. it fits maybe into the multi-tenant aspect of uh, 12C as well, right? Or just simplicity of, of upgrade, of development, if you want to clone a, a test dev copy of uh, one right, of the component right. databases without the whole, the key thing is we still work really well with Oracle and they like working with us. <laughs> Jay, last, last year at Oracle Open World we had a chance to get some uh, candid footage of Tom Georgians with uh, Moneyball. Yeah, the author yeah. writing, signing the books. Obviously big data last year was a lot of hype. Now it's becoming more mainstream. Can you just talk about the perspective of what's happened within NetApp and your view of the industry just one year later around big data. Obviously the database thing you're mentioning is a big part of that, the in-memory and you know, the, the advancement. So what's, what's, what's changed with big data over the past year? I know you guys have been looking at it before that. You've seen some changes in your customer environments in terms of uh, preferred uh, storage solutions, that's non-SQL and so on. So what's, what's the change in one year? Yeah, so a couple of things are going on with big data. Well, first, it's now ascended to the most misunderstood term by our customers, replacing cloud. <laughs> partly because cloud's gotten a little better understood and partly because big data's on the, on the rise. More people are engaging in it, trying to figure out what it means. We work a lot with big data of, of different types. The thing we found most people really need is they need infrastructure which can respond easily and with a high degree of agility to the inflow of, of data that they may be getting. Uh, it could be transactional data or it could be interactional data, but they need to be able to capture it and figure out how to make use of it. So we were talking with Billy Bosworth, the CEO of Datastax, and he says, the DBA is not going to go away, it's going to change to data management expertise, not so much administrating, more of a management, more of a broader portfolio. Analytics and automation are two of the hottest trends that we're tracking in the data infrastructure space. You guys talk about it, about agile data infrastructure. Can you talk about that? One, the, the, the roles within the infrastructure, in terms of the, 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 your customer base, and then two, analytics and automation, and those two trends in particular. You're seeing a lot of uh, even ads in, in the papers and online now, the papers, uh, I'm dating myself, but for uh, data architects and sort of data engineers, people who can figure out how to look at a stream of, of, infra, of data and figure out how to structure it so you can derive information from it. Um, that's a theme, I think it's creating some new types of roles. It's more than just administering a database, it's understanding how to derive value from chaos. Um, the, the infrastructure side of it though is all about how do you build scale, how do you build infrastructure which is always on, because these big analytics applications, uh, they need infrastructure which can come and go as, as it's needed for the different jobs, but as a whole, as a pool of infrastructure, you can't ever really take it down. Analytics are becoming too important part of the interaction with the customer to do that. You guys had a marketing um, 
positioning and a company view a couple of years ago, data efficiency or efficiency, storage efficiency has always been kind of a, a big buzzword as the environments are kind of consolidating and then expanding again under these new architectures. Um, efficiency still is a big part of the equation, right? So you can talk about some of the new challenges around dealing with efficiencies when one, big data is the most misunderstood <laughs> term on the planet, <laughs> and two, there's real cost advantages and, and performance improvements around, say, flash and these new architectures. Yeah, it's, so efficiency and flash go hand in hand with each other. Um, efficiency, just in the, the amount of data that's streaming into companies or organizations or governments anywhere today, they have to figure out how to capture it and how to save it as cost effectively as possible. Everybody knows budgets aren't going up at all, much less at the pace of, of data acquisition. So efficiency is absolutely critical. A lot of the analytics tools out there require you to store multiple copies, three, four, five copies of data in order to protect it, but there's much more efficient ways to do that. So that creates an opportunity for delivering analytics at a, a lower cost point. Flash is changing everything in enterprise storage. Uh, it's still too expensive now to be all of the storage for an application, but it's reached the point now where a little flash integrated with a lot of SATA disk creates a really powerful, app, a powerful combination. So we, Dave and I always talk about NetApp and uh, living in Silicon Valley. It's fun to watch NetApp as a startup emerge into this massive powerhouse. And now you guys have, uh, are the, I call the large independent kind of storage vendor. Everyone seems, everyone else like EMC, they got all kinds of broad portfolios. You guys are so resilient. You always seem to reinvent and move at the pace of the business. Um, can you comment on one, NetApp as a company right now in terms of the health and internal um, feeling and the culture, and then two, the direction you guys are going to take with respect to some of these new changing uh, plans, because storage, as, it, it's an interesting spot that you're in um, with Flash and with the growth of cloud and mobile. Yeah, you know, one of the, the things that sets NetApp apart, and I've been there now about seven years, my history with NetApp goes back even before that, the culture of the company is a major competitive weapon. Uh, from the outset of the first orientation to the behavior of the, of the executives to our history, we tell our people that their job is to take initiative, figure out what needs to be done, uh, figure out how to make their job better and how to make the, the, the success of the people they work with happen faster. But above all things, we're committed to the success of the customers. So we listen to the customers, we understand what they need, try to figure out how we can deliver for our customers what they need. That will allow us, it allows us to, to weather storms, to weather technology transitions. And we pioneered uh, unified storage uh, 10 or 11 years ago now, and that became very popular. We really drove toward, we drove SAN into a company that was religiously on the NAS bandwagon. And now SAN versus NAS is sort of yesterday's argument. It's all just part of network storage. Storage efficiency, integration with VMware and Microsoft and the, the whole virtualization trend, and now our scale-out architecture with clustered on tap. We've been able to continue the pace of innovation, and that really comes as much from the culture of the company as it does from anything else. So NetApp uh, celebrated its 20th anniversary this summer, and um, now you haven't, you haven't been there 20 years, you said you've been there seven, but you know well the history of the big bets that you've made, and I wonder if you could maybe double click on the last point you made about clustering. So you guys bet big on the internet, the dot com, that worked and then it blew up. Then you <laughs> bet on the enterprise, you had to make that transition, and your, your founder Dave Hitz, co-founder, loves to talk about that, and then you bet big on VMware. Mm -hmm. That paid off. Um, you were able to, you know, by our data, uh, and Wikibon, we've studied this intensely, keep pace with EMC who owns VMware. Yeah. Um, yeah. You guys would argue that you actually integrate better with VMware than, than like anybody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, well, you've got a yeah. strong argument. Um, and now you're making a big bet on, on clustering. Um, talk about that and scale out. Talk about that, why that's so important, and why you'll succeed. Yeah, well it, it comes back to what we were talking about before with the, the pace of data acquisition and data creation in companies now is, is so high that, and they, they can't afford to throw it away, so they have to figure out how to, how to manage it. On top of that, they're consolidating infrastructure at a rapid pace. So VMware allowed people to consolidate servers at a 10 or 15 to one rate, which consolidated data centers in turn, which drove to a higher consolidation of storage. The net effect is most of our customers now have a smaller number of much larger points of IT. And therefore those larger points of IT have to serve a much larger base of applications. They have to always be on, they have to be able to scale inexpensively to start small and grow to infinity, and they also have to bring a lot of intelligence to deliver the efficiency and the, the range of workloads and applications that NetApp's always been known for. 
So one of the things that we always talk about on theCUBE and at SiliconANGLE is this role of the operating system. We talked about the internet operating system, storage operating systems, um, data center operating systems, and we're seeing a trend where storage has become such a pivotal role in these converged infrastructures or data infrastructures or software infrastructures, software-defined networking or whatever, that the role of data where storage was involved is becoming the epicenter or the heart of the, this new OS. Not just storage OS, but the data about data is really critical and that's going to affect network virtualization and other kind of cool new emerging areas. So the question I have for you is, this is going to impact a lot of traditional markets that you guys played in. I see in, in verticals like healthcare, finance, other big verticals. Um, and then also the, um, the uh, data warehousing and business intelligence markets, which are, were slow moving mm. markets. The pressure of real time and this convergence with storage is at the center of the operating system. You look at VMworld, they're all like operating systems. Pool, abstract, compute. So I want to get your perspective and NetApp's perspective on this trend. Data warehouse is a business intelligence. It has a long tail, we talked to some folks earlier. It's always going to be around, it's not going to be going away soon, but yet it's under massive disruption. How does NetApp and the storage business get in there and move Data warehouse business intelligence to the to a new environment faster, a modern infrastructure, if you will. Yeah, it's yeah, the, there's a, a couple of these trends that are going on in, in data warehousing and analytics. Um, the world seems to be dividing a bit into the the long running, deeply complex, looking over big trends of time analytics to do more sort of background analytics, and the real time, got to decide how much can I get, what kind of decision can I make in, in 40 milliseconds to be able to respond to the user. And those two types of applications are different now. Over time, we think they, they will start to converge, but there'll be more detailed analysis you want to do that takes longer, and there'll be things you want to do faster with more data. So Moore's Law will allow more technology to be applied to both of those application types. The key role that storage has to play is it has to make the data available inexpensively, sort of a capacity tier for those long-running analytics, and then available instantly in an IOPS tier for those rapidly running so analytics. So batch analytics would be like, throw it over there, work on it, and then the real time is it's mobile or... And you, you want, so you'll never be able to afford to have all your data in the real time storage infrastructure, because you'll always want to have more data than you can afford to put there. But Flash is creating infrastructure to allow much more rapid response. So architectures which integrate Flash with hard drives allow you to, to manage the data the most effectively to put the cooler data where you don't need it and the hot data where you so do. So bring that back to NetApp for the folks that might not be in the, inside the ropes of the NetApp. How does that relate to the current offering? So NetApp is, we, we've been working with Flash integrated with our, our uh, FAS, our Fabric Attached Storage Controllers, for about three or four years now. Uh, we have SSDs you can incorporate in for, to accelerate the performance of drives. We have uh, flash in PCI cards in the controller to speed up read performance. We also have software that runs on the host to use flash that exists on the host to accelerate reads even faster for the applications that are running in the, uh, the application hosts. So now, um, you've also made some you know, partnership announcements, you've made some big announcements of your own, so you're, you're building that flash stack out pretty substantially. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about where you see that going? So it, in the long run, we see Flash existing as close as possible to the applications, but because it will always be more expensive per, per gigabyte or per terabyte than hard disk, you're going to want to optimize the use of it extensively. So we believe the right model is you want Flash close to the application, on the memory bus of the servers or close to the network, but it's cache. And it is dynamically loaded and managed from the backing store of hard drives, which have all the data, in a way that gives the performance you need at a much more economic point. The last thing somebody wants to do is spend money on flash to hold data you're not accessing. Cold flash is a sin. Cold <laughs> flash. So, yeah, right, right. <laughs> now, like I've, cold dead fish. <laughs> I've made the point a number of times, yeah, with somebody's <laughs> marketing. Um, I made the point a number of times that the function has moved out of the host into the, into the SAN and now sort of, sort of moving back. ONTAP has been the point of management for that, that, a lot of that function, that data management epicenter, and made a lot of sense. How does that flesh out yeah. with Flash? Can, can slower storage manage faster server, close to the server Flash, or does something have to change there? And it's, if so, what does that mean for you, know, you guys? Yeah, the, it, the key thing is with, with Flash close to the applications, it's easy for a backing store, like a, a capacity tier, like an ONTAP system, to easily load a large amount of data at a time. 
faster than the applications are consuming it, are, are going to read it. Because the, the application is going to read randomly. So you just want a, enough of a working set in memory in the application host, feeding that from the, the storage systems is the way to make that work well. When you had a tiny bit of flash in the host, it was too hard for the, the storage to, to fill it quick enough uh, in, in response to the application. When you can put a terabyte of flash in a host, that's a pretty big working set. Most applications will work fine within a terabyte or four terabytes or six terabytes of flash. So then it just becomes, how do you protect it? The last thing anybody wants to do is have to back up a thousand individual servers or 5,000 individual VMs in each having their own discrete process. You want everything up at the, the server side to be stateless, so you can turn it on or off. If it breaks down, you can run the apps on a different server, and have all the data managed in a central way. That's Jay, really what ONTAP is driving. Jay, talk about uh, Larry Ellison, okay? Um, we love Larry, he's been, he's a statesman, industry legend, he's a tech athlete, as we say, and he's one of the old guys still, still punching. He you is. got Joe Tucci out there on the East Coast, and you know, Scott McNeely's pretty much retired, he's doing some side deals, and son's playing golf. Read about that on Facebook all the time. Um, but Larry's up there, he's, he's punching, he's a showman. What do you think of his Exadata presentation? I mean, that was pretty aggressive. I mean, he slams EMC, so we'll see what, how Joe Tucci responds. I mean, so you see that out there. What's your comments on his uh, mojo and his, vi and his, uh, his uh, maybe he's oversimplifying it, but uh, yeah, what's your opinion on his presentation? So, you know, Larry's his reputation in the industry, and he has done a phenomenal number of things in the industry. You know, Oracle's a, a company of tremendous power and influence. Uh, there's been no secret that Larry wanted to own his own data center agenda, infrastructure, be able to write the script for a company for their entire data center infrastructure. The whole Sun acquisition and the Exadata play gives him a box with which to do that. Where we disagree, and most of the customers I talk to is, I ask them what they think of Oracle's full end-to-end -end system agenda, and they say, well, if my or uh, applications are Oracle, I'll look at Oracle hardware. If they're not, I won't. <laughs> so I think that the, it'd be difficult for Oracle to own the whole data center with the agenda they have, but then you see the other things that Larry doesn't talk about quite as much, of Oracle partnering with people and doing the right thing for customers across a much wider range of workloads than Exit serves. Uh, but it's, it's entertainment, <laughs> and it's it interesting. Never well, we sure agree with you. I mean, we've commented earlier this morning that uh, he wants to be the Steve Jobs of the enterprise, Apple of the enterprise, and you know, Apple doesn't own my home. I have the other, I have cable TV, and so they don't own my home. So I don't think enterprises who, I mean, I don't think anyone's ever been successful as the one-stop shop going back to maybe IBM back Since in IBM the probably, 40s, right? 50s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a multi-vendor world. Exactly. Um, so maybe in a silo, Larry's got a, you know, baked out solution, but the reality is CIOs have to deal with legacy and multi-vendor. So given that, how does a CIO and their team of developers look to the future, given the noise of what's going on around them? Well, I think there's certain trends which are secular across old and new, big and small. The virtualization of servers is widespread. The consolidation of storage, and we believe ultimately the scale out of storage will become widespread as well. The, the evolution of networks to be software-defined networks, I think it's a widespread trend as well. What CIOs need to look for is trends which are adopted and embraced by more than a single vendor in the industry. As you know, a single vendor is a rogue story. Three or four vendors leading a trend is going to create enough choices for a CIO to make, but still push the technology forward. Um, this industry is, has, has not succeeded on the innovations of a single vendor well, we, along the we way. We believe, and we've been commenting that we believe that there'll be a data center operating system, a lot of multi-vendors, a lot of subsystems, a lot of coordination, automation. I think your, your data infrastructure is a cool positioning. Um, so that being said, the future seems to be in the software-defined networking, because that's like the last bottleneck of convergence, yeah. right? It's like the last stop. Okay, we've got servers are done, storage is getting looking really good off the tee right now, now you go back to networking, Cisco, Juniper, and now VMware has Nasira. So, yeah. NetApp, I mean, you got to look at that and say, hey, we know, we, know soft, we know software, we know a little bit about hardware and move da moving data around. What's your take on one, software-defined networking, software-defined software virtualization, or network virtualization, and how does that affect you guys? So we're a, we're a participant in the data center, but we're really not caught up in the, the, the evolution of architectures and networking. We work in layer two networks, layer three networks, and we can be found in the network and where the data resides. I've had a few people ask me about software-defined storage. 
And I point out that, you know. That's you. Yeah, we already do that. <laughs> well, we already do that, but the one thing in the data center that actually still does work when you turn off all the power is the storage. It holds the data. When you turn it back on, it's still there. So that has mass, it has gravity. It's the Higgs boson of the da data center <laughs> architecture, right? So it doesn't float like around that. quite as readily as you'll see in some of the other architectures. So NetApp is focused on storage and data management. We play well with the net networking vendors, we play well with, with the, uh, the application vendors, great relationship with Cisco, with VMware, with Microsoft. We're happy with our position in the market, I think we can grow from there. So but since I've been in this business, I've been told that hardware's going to be commoditized. Um, and you've been in the business a long time, I've right? I've been in this <laughs> yeah. a long time, you can tell by my gray hair. <laughs> Having said that, with the consumerization of IT, all this software-led you know, networking, software-defined storage, you know, Hadoop, uh, you're, you're getting to the point where um, there's a major push from companies like Oracle and VMware, maybe even to commoditize uh, uh, hardware even further. At the same time, you see gross margins you know, yeah. aren't, I mean, they're pretty steady. You know, maybe not inside of Oracle for the hardware side, but they'll, they'll creep back up. What's your take on that, Jay? I mean, custom ASICs, not custom ASICs. You, you, you see it in both places. Is it more the same? Um, is there legs to that commoditization of hardware? And what does that mean to NetApp? You know, you hear about commoditization of hardware a lot. You almost never hear about commoditization of software. Well, open source <laughs> commoditizes software, right? I mean, well, not really, because there's a lot of innovation I mean, in, in open source, and right. it's, you know, <laughs> it, it may lower the cost of deployment, but that's not equal to commoditization. Right. Commoditization is the sort of the absence of innovation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think software's got a long way to go. NetApp is first and foremost a software company that we apply our software to the most cost-effective hardware we can get, and we do amazing things with efficiency of storing data. So I think commoditization is a trend for disk drives and for some semiconductor parts, but it, I wouldn't really say it's a trend in the storage industry or the network industry or the application industry. In the industry. enterprise in general. Yeah. I think lower cost will always be a trend. That's table stakes though, isn't That's it? That's table stakes, yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Commoditization is, implies a lack of innovation, I don't think that's the table that people want to play at. You were talking about earlier about IT budgets, and the, the discourse in the industry for the last 10 years, really since Nick Carr wrote, does IT matter, mm -hmm. has been do more with less, IT cannot bring sustainable competitive advantage. With the big data discussion, uh, there seems to be a change in that sentiment. Um, you're seeing real examples and use cases of of analytics and big data applications actually having a fundamental change in the, the productivity of organizations. Do you see, in our lifetimes, yeah. when CEOs start to say, okay, we have to invest more in IT as a percentage of revenues, have we cut to the, to the yeah. muscle <laughs> and will we, will we bounce off the bottom, in your view? You know, I, I think CEOs will look at that and say, I get a tremendous amount of value from a few innovative things done in IT. And how much did they cost? That's all? <laughs> That's not where most of the cost is. 80% of the cost in IT is in keeping the lights on in legacy applications. Yeah. And I don't think that these innovations that are going to create competitive advantage are going to be in, ever be legacy. They'll always be innovating. Which is, it comes back to sort of where we started, of the whole agility of infrastructure and the agility of data. People need infrastructure that can respond quickly, that can change quickly, and that they need architectures that can change quickly to allow them to take advantage of and create competitive advantage based on the data that's flowing in. That's never going to cost that, that much to do, uh, to create that innovation. Uh, if you're intelligent and efficient around what you do with the infrastructure you have. So follow up on that is, the, is to your point, the biggest cost you said is the legacy infrastructure, it's the labor to keep those lights on. I mean, it's probably two thirds of the cost of what we spend, of spending, not revenue, but spending is, is in labor. Do we have to solve that problem before that vision I just laid out can occur? Or, and, and what are we doing to solve that problem? You know, I think you look at the labor cost in IT and um, it has gone down as a percentage um, actually, it's gone up as a percentage yeah. of it because the cost of hardware has come down. Right. But the amount of productivity and how much work each individual done is, it does has still gone way up. I think if you have a static, in, static environment where nothing is changing, you can worry about lowering the cost of labor. So if a company isn't growing at all, you worry about lowering the cost of labor. As long as things are changing, you're taking advantage of new infrastructure, what's happening is the labor is shifting. It's shifting from people who just run hardware and keep hardware running to those innovators who work on new applications that run on the, the big data analytics and on Hadoop jobs and things. You shift the, the labor to there. So it's a skill shift in labor rather than an absolute reduction So that, what does that mean in your view to 
a storage admin in a, in a DBA circa, you know, 2000. You know, how does that, how does that change their role? So I, you used to look at the, the very distinct roles that exist, the server admin, the DBA, the storage admin, the network admin, the, and now we see a lot of organizations that have shifted to a, managing a, a vertical stack. You want to provision an application with a golden image of a, an a Oracle database loaded in a VM, uh, deployed with, st with storage, with backup protection, that's all done by one team. And the expertise across the domains spans across everyone on the team. That kind of rapid provisioning of an entire infrastructure stack, that's something that we've, we've worked on with FlexPod and our, our technology at, at NetApp. But bringing people together to do that as a team is what's going to change the way that the, the labor force in IT looks in the future. So Jay, how are you spending your time these days? When we first met, you were you know, running marketing at NetApp, you went through the major brand transformation, which has been very successful. Uh, the Storage 5000 was sort of under your watch there, another really successful initiative that, that, that you guys propelled. Uh, and then you went into the product roles, yeah. right? What, what are you doing these days? So my passion has always been the technology and how NetApp can bring innovation that matters to our customers. Uh, so I've been spending more and more time on that, looking at what we do with our management products, our clustered on tap, and the scale out architectures. And I'm just looking, at, I spend more of my time on what we're doing and what's our overall innovation agenda, and I'll be digging in even deeper to on that the in the future. On the product side or field side? Or? More on the product side, what we build, the products we build. You know, first and foremost, we're a product company with a, a great go-to-market team, um, but the innovation in our products is really the soul of the, the long-term growth of NetApp. On that, we love products, we love product conversations, yeah. so I have to ask the big data question because we had the DataStax guy and we've always talked to Cloudera, Hortonworks, so the Apache, obviously open source is great, scale out open source, you know, rah rah, it's, it's doing great. However, the reality of servicing scale is a challenge operationally and all the efficiency things, so what's your plans for Hadoop uh, or NoSQL or, you know, is it Mongo, we have Mongo guys coming on too later yeah. today. Obviously there's interest in having a schema light or a somewhat non-complicated -com schema store for batch and or real time. And that has to, it's going to be part of the portfolio at some point, not replacing anything. Yeah, you may lose some business here and there, but for the most part, it's going to be a new element. How do you look at that product-wise and what's NetApp doing? So we often look at, you know, and I think what you're asking about is do we need to get into the database business in some way or have that as a piece of our, our offering like EMC did with, with uh, Greenplum. And our belief is we <laughs> <can> <laughs> 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 I don't think so. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, think we, we can serve in. There's a lot of database players out there. Yeah. <laughs> partner with a few of them. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. you'd be good on that front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. We're partnering with, with Oracle, with Microsoft, yeah. with Mongo, with Hadoop, with Hortonworks. We believe we have just outstanding technology for storing data and managing the data that is stored. That doesn't mean we have to get into the database you, business or open move source. Up track. Open source is great. It, it incubates the market, and you know, Oracle is great at doing what what big companies do is they see it across the chasm, they put their blanket over it, we now have that too. So you guys bring a lot of industrial strength products to the market, management mentioned other mm -hmm. things. So, so with that, what's, what about the big data, uh, I call it the mushroom patch, a lot of mushrooms yeah. are growing and, and some of them will be ripe, some will die, right? So, so you got to look at that. So what are you looking for in particular for breakout products and tech from that area? So in, in the big data side, we develop solutions to work in the Hadoop world. We're looking at what we can do inside Hadoop. I'm not going to say too much about it here and oh now. Yeah. What oh. we can do in that open source world to allow Hadoop infrastructures to run more efficiently and with a closer and more cooperative linkage to the backing store that may be in the archive of data that may not be residing on the Hadoop grid at that, that moment. There's a lot that can be done yeah. with, with scale out architecture in that, that area. So we, we know, we know cool you've been looking at it. We talked to Val many times on theCUBE, going back to some SNWs ago, a couple years ago. So we know it's on your radar. I just want to get your perspective and share that. So I'm reminded, John, of the interview we did with Jeff Hammerbacher, uh, mm -hmm. one of the founders of, of Cloudera. He was talking about when he was at Facebook, one of his missions was to you know, break the, the, the shackles of the container. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. now in a way, you guys have been in the container business, right? Now, having broken Larry's the shackles. that too, we heard containers yeah, last night. Yeah. So having broken the shackles of the container business, you know, let's call it Hadoop, uh, the problem is it's not robust enough for the yeah. enterprise. Yeah. So does that you know, exploded container sort of change shape and become more robust, or do we go to a more containerized <laughs> traditional 
storage world in the, in, <laughs> in the Hadoop, if that makes sense. It's, you know, it's, it's a good question, and one of the tensions in storage has always been between agility and flexibility of the data you need to work on versus protection of that data. Right. And protecting things tends to still be, a, there's a container mentality to protecting things, either a volume or a tape or something I can go and recover <laughs> from. Um, the, the architecture that protection is done by just making multiple copies through the infrastructure, it's sort of the equivalent of backing up your personal data by emailing all your files to your friends. It works, but when you need to get something back, it's pretty unpredictable how soon you're going to get it back. And the same thing exists in the Hadoop to infrastructure. Mm. So enterprises, they want great analytics, but they want predictable performance, particularly for these real-time type analytics. So you got to figure out how to make the infrastructure predictable, yet still protect the data within it. And that may be two separate problems that needs two different architectures. Jay yeah. Kidd with NetApp, Senior Vice President, Agile Infrastructure, Data Infrastructure, Agile Programming, if you don't understand what that is, Agile Infrastructure is kind of the same concept. We didn't have a chance to talk about applications and data is kind of where apps kind of come together. A uh, whole nother conversation opportunity. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.